There's a, a famous sister in our faith uh, named Corey Timboom, and she has a quote that I think is very timely for us in this world and then very timely for kind of where we've been in the book of Isaiah. It says this, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. Can I get an amen? <laughs> if you look within, you will be depressed. But if you look at God, you will be at rest. I'll say it in its fullness again. If you look at the world, you will be distressed. If you look within, you will be depressed. But if you look at God, you will be at rest. The hope is not out there, and it's definitely not in here. The hope is in our Savior. And Corey Ten Boom highlights the reality that you want to be at rest today. You want to find comfort for your soul. You want to be strengthened again. You look nowhere but the throne of God. So that's what we shall do this morning. If you walk away with nothing else, walk away with this phrase. God has come to bring comfort and strength to those who behold him. God has come to bring comfort and strength to those who behold him. The title of the message this morning is Beholding Hope. Beholding Hope, and that hope is God himself. God doesn't just have hope for you. He is your hope. You will not find it outside of him. It's not a means to a greater end. He is the greater end. And so we look to him alone. But now this begs the question for us to ask, what does it mean to behold God? It sounds like a fancy church word. Uh, you're going to see it all throughout the chapter uh, 40 here in Isaiah, this idea of behold. That's the kind of the, the word that keeps drawing us back is behold, 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 behold. What does it mean? I'm glad you asked. It means look intently at, to gaze upon, to see with attention, to be fixed on, to be in awe of, to observe with care. In other words, to get lost in. It's actually what we talked a lot about last week. And in fact, we experienced this last week in, in this place where we were just gazing upon the beauty of God and people began to become undone. It wasn't this like emotional thing, although people were in tears. It wasn't just an emotional thing. It was people were actually seeing and encountering the presence of God. It was so thick in the room. Literally someone had to leave because they felt like they couldn't breathe. That actually happened. <laughs> we saw physical healing happen. We saw someone come to Christ last week. We saw people actually walk in freedom and victory over things that have been kind of like these massive monkeys on their back. They, they were able to let them go in Jesus' name. I mean, we just saw people in awe of the fact that God loves us, in awe of the fact that God came to save us because of why? We were fixated on him. We were beholding him. We were not letting anything get in the way of just gazing upon his beauty. And so again, that's what we're here to do. So let's gaze upon Jesus today, church. The first thing we need to see about beholding him is that we behold him and we behold his word. We have to behold his word. Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 9. Starting in verse 1, it says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. This is an incredibly beautiful transition, again, from this kind of uh, section of judgment where we just see, again, God laces it with grace for sure, but there's a lot of judgment, a lot of indictment coming against his people and the surrounding nations. And yet, as the, t the corner turns, he says, Comfort. And in case you forgot it, let me say it again. Comfort. My people, says your God. God has come to bring a message of comfort to his people. His people were stubborn. They were ignorant. They didn't listen. They messed up. They jacked it up. They were tore up from the floor up. And yet, God came to bring them a word of comfort. Isn't that hopeful for you this morning and for me? Like if you're here this morning and maybe your eyes are down because you feel ashamed or guilty or embarrassed, God is here to give you comfort. That's the message, that's the posture he comes to give you is comfort in Jesus' name. That's what he's here to give. And he's reminding them that they are his people and he is their God. Notice that language. He says, comfort my people. Even in the midst of their stubbornness, God is still claiming them to be his. And so if you feel today that like maybe you're, you're too dirty or too smelly or too gross that like God wouldn't want anything to do with you. No, he calls you, if you're in Christ, his people. That's what he's saying here to Israel. Like, you're, you're mine. And I'm yours. I'm your God. And so let's act as such. Verse 2, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her war warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sin. So, so listen to what God is speaking to Israel and then therefore in Christ speaking to you and me. He comes to speak in a tender and loving way to the heart. He comes to speak tenderly. How do you envision God speaking to you? Like when, when you read the Bible, do you see an angry, grumpy old man kind of sitting up on his throne, like arms crossed, like frustrated at you? Or do you see the picture Isaiah paints? He's coming to speak tenderly. 
And again, it's not like God is just like brushing their mess to the side. He sees all their mess in its fullness and still chooses to speak tenderly to them. That's what he's doing here. He's speaking tenderly and lovingly. He's not trying to say a shallow word. He's not saying something hollow. It's not just like a a little gesture to kind of uh, move on. No, he's trying to speak to their souls. And that's what he's here to do for you and me. What is he saying to them? He's saying their warfare is over. Can you imagine the sigh of relief that Israel is able to breathe now? They're, they're in captivity. We talked about that last week. They are in captivity to Babylon because of their ignorance and their arrogance. Like they have been captured. And they're in this constant war zone and warfare type mentality. And they're getting their tails kicked in, to be quite frank. And yet God comes to say to them, look, the warfare is over. The warfare has been ended. And the same is true for you and me in Christ. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That's 1 John verse four, or chapter 4, verse 4. It's great news. He continues on to say her iniquity is pardoned. So their sin has been paid for. Their sin has been paid for. Not just excused. God didn't lower his standard. God never moves his standard because our sin. He actually just deals with our sin. And again, God's grace and mercy doesn't just say, hey, it's no big deal. Like, you know, don't worry about it. He says, no, it's a massive deal. And I've come to take care of it in its fullness by giving my blood. When I sent my son Jesus to die on the cross and resurrect to prove that the death actually worked. And same is true for you and me in Jesus, that our sin, our iniquity has been paid for. The beauty of Christianity, the beauty of the gospel is not that our sin has just now uh, no longer has power. It's actually that it's been paid for. Like your sin, my sin has been paid for. And if you're like, but, but I, you don't know what I did last night. It doesn't matter. The blood of Christ pleads your innocence. Will you believe it though? Will you trust it this morning? Will you, will you sit in that? Will you rest in that reality? Because that's what is being offered to Israel. And that's what's being offered us in Jesus, that their sin has been paid for. Verse three says, a voice cries. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become a level and rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Again, God is coming to speak a word to these people. Like God's word has power. God says, let there be light and light is. Like light wasn't a thing. God said, let it happen. It happens. God's word has the power to speak and create. And so that's what's happening. And he's like, I'm going to speak a new word to you. That's what he's speaking to his people. That's what he's come to speak to you in the person of Jesus. You can have new life. You can have new life. You can have new life. Will you receive the word? He's saying prep is needed because a king, king is coming to town. That, that's the new word for the people of Israel. Hey, the king's coming. You need to prepare the way. You need to prepare the way. The king's coming. You need to roll out the red carpet. Royalty is coming to town and you need to act like it. And so he's saying that there needs to be a way prepared. There needs to be a path made straight. I love the commentary that I read on this specific text. It says, they were calling the nation to get back into a proper relationship with God. Each gospel writer applied Isaiah 40 verse 3 to John the Baptist. All of them attribute this uh, kind of John the Baptist being the epiphany of this text. Like he's the one. He's the one who's ultimately doing this because he's preparing the way for whom? Jesus. And so we see that that's what John was up to. John was a desert prophet who prepared the way for Jesus Christ and who is in the wilderness and makes a highway for him. However, here in Isaiah, the entire nation was in a spiritual wilderness. And each Israelite needed to get ready spiritually for the appearing of the Lord and his glory. So the raising of valleys and the lowering of mountains refer to, in hyperbole, the workmen leveling or smoothing out the roads on which a person would travel when he came to an area to visit. So today the equivalent phrase would be roll out the red carpet because royalty is coming to town. In Isaiah's day, he was calling Israel to be smoothed out so that the Lord could come to the nation and rule. So here, here's the reality. The same call is for us today. The Holy Spirit has come to smooth out, to level everything so that we'd see and gaze upon the beauty of Jesus and we'd have a highway prepared that he could come and meet us and he could redeem us and rescue us and restore us and provide new life and empower us to go make an impact in this world. So this is the good news of the call that Jesus gives us and that he was giving to them. Verse six, a voice says, cry. And then Isaiah said, and, and what shall I cry? All flesh is grass 
and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. Listen to verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. So what's being communicated here? One grass, the equivalent of grass, it's people, it's the flesh. It says it'll wither. It'll die off. Like, think about this. This was a nation that was in desperate need for some hope. Like, it seemed like darkness was surrounding them. Chaos was ensuing. They were actually enabling the more chaos because they weren't listening, and God shows up. And of all the things God could say, what does he say? The flesh is weak. People will perish. People are, people are going to fade. They will not last. You know what will? My word. He begins to paint this beautiful word picture of th this grass that will ultimately fade in flowers. Flowers represent the beauty of the flesh. Those things that seem enticing to you and me, the things that we can seem to put our hope in, they'll, they'll fade. They'll fade too. Like, it doesn't matter how pretty you are on the outside, you're going to get old someday, right? Right? We, we see like things just, you know, over time they rust, right? We see things happen where, again, exterior beauty will diminish over time, but yet the word of God, its beauty will never fade. In fact, it's like wine. It just gets better over time. This continues to increase in beauty. The word of the Lord will stand forever. This is good news because it means we can trust it. It means the word of God's not outdated or irrelevant. It's what the world's teaching us. Do you know that? That's what's being indoctrinated in our children. Huh, that, that's irrelevant. That's old school. God, that's not the same God today. Yes, it is. It absolutely is. Like the Bible is just as relevant today as, as the day it was written. It's the day it was spoken. It can change your life. We believe this isn't a document that collects dust. It's a living and active word. It has the ability to transform and change us. So, so I say all the time, don't just read the Bible. Let it read you. Let it change you. Let it convict you. Let it encourage you. Let it actually change how you think, live, and act. Because again, the word of God is forever. It is very relevant to our lives. And here's, here's where it gets really like boots on the ground. Jesus is the word made flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among them, John chapter 1 tells us. In other words, Jesus put on skin and came and he said, I'm going to hang out with them. And I'm going to show you what the word of God looks like with feet, with hands, with scars, with getting down on my knees and getting dirty and bruised up and ultimately going to the cross and then beating death when I raise, resurrect from the grave. But he keeps his nail-pierced hands to remind us the word of God has been made flesh. That's what he's here to remind us of. Jesus is eternal and everlasting. And here, here's where it gets really practical for us today. God's word is greater. God's word is greater. Well, greater than what? Let, let me tell you, your opinion. I remember being at a conference of about 55,000 college students. And this really well-known preacher gets up and he reads a passage of scripture. And, and afterwards he says, you want to know what I think? And there was a, a silence and the crowd began to erupt. And he goes, no, 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 do you want to know what I think? And then the stadium just blew up. And he literally, he pauses and he goes, that's your problem. <laughs> you care far too much about what other people think. I was like, oh snap, mic drop, leave. Like everyone's convicted, repentance needs to happen right now, right? <laughs> I'll never forget that moment. It was probably 10 years ago now. And what it reminded me of and kind of solidified for me, like, right, we value people's opinions way too much, especially our own. We val you value your opinion. I love you enough to tell you, you think too much about your own opinion. Let that liberate you today. Quit, quit worrying about what you think or what other people think of you. Care about what God thinks. Like we've said all the time, like when's the last time you asked the question, what does God think about this? Is God cool with me doing this? Is God cool with me saying that? Is God cool with me eating there or hanging out with those folks? Like that's the question that needs to dominate our thinking. Like what is God's opinion? God's word is greater than the message of the day, than the overwhelming majority. Like, like trusting God's word is not a popular opinion, especially in today's age. And so there's going to be an overwhelming majority that think you're insane. It doesn't change the fact that God's word is greater. It's greater than your feelings. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Which again, I'm not here to knock your feelings. They're from God. Emotions are good. God's an emotional God. Yet your emotions don't dictate what you do. They can be indicators and they can help gauge where you're at, but they don't d dictate or they're not guiding you. Like Jesus does. His word does. And you can actually, in the power of Jesus, with the authority of Holy Spirit in you, tell your emotions to be quiet and for Jesus to stand up. Like that can happen in your heart and in your mind. That's what it means to renew your thoughts. Take every thought captive. So that's, that's what's good news for us this morning. God's word is better than your feelings. It's better than what's popular. It's actually better than what seems loving. Like, like we live in a world that says like, 
like love looks a certain way or it can be very optimistic and open-ended. And yet God's word says, hey, regardless of what the world says about what seems loving or seems right, like God's word is ultimately what stands. And the Bible actually tells us what seems right to man leads to death. It's not a new phenomenon that we're witnessing today. We just have social media to inundate us, right? God's saying, no, what seems right actually leads you to, to the cliff, cliff of death. Like, don't trust what you think is right or what feels right to you. Like, the Bible also says your heartful is deceit, deceitful above all things. So that Disney mantra of, like, trust your gut, trust your heart, bad idea. Because the word of God is superior to your gut and to your feelings. God's word is better than temptations of the flesh and, and enticements of this world. There are things in your mind and in your, in your eyes at times that will seem tempting, that will seem better than the word of God and what it promises. That's why we have to know and to behold the word of God so when temptation comes, not if, it's not like coming to, Christian, coming to Christianity or coming to Jesus puts you in this bubble that uh, makes you immune to temptation. Jesus was tempted in every way. If he was tempted, so will you and I be tempted. So it's not saying you're immune to temptation. You can just actually overcome it. But you can't unless you're beholding the word of God. That's got to be the foundation, the anchor upon which you are rooted in. I want you to hear this. Beholding the word of God anchors our hearts and minds in truth, which equips us to weather any storm. Beholding the word of God anchors our hearts and minds in truth, which equips us to weather any storm. Simple way of saying it is this. Lies are shaky. Truth is stable. Lies are shaky. Truth is stable. If you're feeling unstable, it's probably because you're grounded on lies. And again, you don't need to beat yourself up about that. You just need to quit believing the lies. And you can because God is here to give you truth. And you can anchor yourself, anchor your life on truth. That will allow you to weather any storm. You may bend, but you won't break. If you build your house on the solid, stable foundation, it doesn't matter what kind of storm comes at you. It doesn't matter if some shingles fall off your house. Or if your roof needs repair, hey, we know a guy who can do some roof repair here, right? Jeremy, you got us, bro? You can do some roof repair? Yeah. So it doesn't matter if your house gets beat up a little bit. It's not going to crumble. It's not going to fall. Build your house on sand. It definitely will. God is saying, build your house on the rock. Build your house on Jesus, and it will be stable. So here's the question, church. Where are you anchored? Where are you anchored? Like, what are you allowing your life to be tethered to on a daily basis? What's the dominating thing that's controlling your thoughts? This is why we, I want to plead with you this morning. Spend time in the Word of God. And I'm not knocking, like, little devotions before and after work or, you know, the five minutes you get in silence. Or for some of us with little kids, like, you have to lock yourself in the bathroom so you can get some time with Jesus. Right? Like, that, that's good. And yet we need to carve out intentional time to, to be in the word of God, what you value, what you prioritize, you give time to. It doesn't matter the season of life, what other excuses you could have. Like I know people, myself included, love to golf, right? Golf takes like five hours. No problem carving out time to golf. Yet, yet do we prioritize the word of God? And so God is saying to us, like prioritize what you value. Spend time in the word of God. It's not this like, hey, this is the, the religious do good thing to move on to the next thing. No, it's how you encounter God's presence is through his word. To, to read it and again, to let it read you. So just some practical things here. If you're like, man, I want to get in the Bible, but it's overwhelming. I don't know where to start. Start in the book of John or start in the book of Ephesians. Highly recommend starting in those two places. And you may ask why you're going to get a lot of Jesus in those two books. And you're going to see his superiority and his supremacy in those two books. John is going to reveal God, or Jesus to be God and to be the solution, to be the, the ultimate one to everything that we could have or ask for. And he, you're going to see his life and how he lived, how he encountered with people. You're going to see Jesus, boots on the ground, doing life and seen as superior as God. Start in the book of John. Or start in Ephesians. You're going to learn about who you are in Christ. The first three chapters are all about how awesome God is and how awesome you now are because he is awesome. And then you're going to see the next three chapters say, now because he's awesome and you're awesome, live in an awesome way. Practical hands-on. How do you do life? How do you do marriage? How do you parent your kids? How do you stand firm against spiritual attacks? Start in one of those two books. And man, if you're like, I, okay, great, but, but I don't know how to even tackle that. Well, we have some resources for you. I have a, a guide. Again, this is out on uh, the table in the lobby before you leave. We have a, a Bible study method called Ransom. Uh, and it's a hands-on practical way to like walk through sections of scripture and begin to piece it apart in a way that can be understandable and relatable. 
We also have a bookmark out there, a green little bookmark that has the little acronym, Ransom, that'll help you understand, again, how to navigate passages of scripture. So again, be in the word of God. Let it read you, let it transform you. If you think that coming here two hours a week is gonna change and transform your spiritual life, you're wrong. I love you enough to tell you, you need more than just a gathering once a week or twice a week if we're super holy, right? (laughs) You need an everyday relationship with God that's primarily done through his word and through communion with him in prayer. And again, it, it may feel like a labor of love to start, but I promise you, if you make that discipline a habit, you're going to fall in love with it because it's going to ultimately not lead you just to a book, but to the living God. So, so that's where I want to end to this point with get into the word of God so that you can know the God of the word. The Bible is a means to an end. The end is God himself. So not reading it to just check it off a list or reading it to encounter a living God who gladly is eager on the balls of his feet to encounter you and engage you when you come to him. Verse 9, go on top of a mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. So again, the word of God here, it's a message. The word of God, we should behold it because God is saying here in this book right here, he's saying to the people of Israel, listen, I want you to go up on a mountain. Like I have some good news that I want you to share and that I have for you and that I want you to give away. But, but look at the context. He says, it's so good. You need to go on top of a mountain. Like have you ever had something that's just bubbling up inside of you? Like I remember, literally I proposed to my wife on a mountain. All right, because I'm like, I want the whole world to know. I love this woman, right? Like you have something in your gut that's just so contagious that you got to get out. So go on top of a mountain and shout it to the, to the world. He said, I got good news that you want to shout. Lift up your voice with strength. It's not something you should just whisper. It's something we should shout and scream from a place of strength. And he says to fear not. Don't don't be afraid. You have no need to fear. You know who I am? That's ultimately what leads to the message. What is the message that God wants them to get on a mountain with strength and shout out with no fear? Behold your God. Behold him. That's the same message for you and me. Jesus has come so that we could behold our God. And Jesus has come to tell us, hey, live a life so people can behold God your God. Second point this morning, we behold his character. We behold his word and we behold his character. Verse 10. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. So we behold him because he is a mighty king. He is the mighty king. He has come to us in might. Our God is not weak. Our God is not feeble. Our God does not need to take a break. He does not need to rest. He is mighty. He is powerful. And he rules from a place of strength. That's God's constant position in ruling and reigning over the world. is a place of strength. That's all he has. He brings a reward to his people. And this is ultimately what Jesus does. We see this wrapped up in the person and work of Jesus. He comes and he rides in right on Palm Sunday on a donkey. Behold your king. Jesus is the mighty king who's come to rule and reign from the place of strength. So for us, he is the mighty king, therefore we gladly submit to him. If Jesus is mighty king, what is your place? What is my place? To submit to his kingship. Again, Christianity is not a democracy. It's not a dictatorship. It's a monarchy. We have a king who is good and right and loving. And if you're wondering if you can trust him, like, like, I, I don't know. Is he a king of integrity? Yes. He puts his money where his mouth is. He came and he laid his life down to show you how good he is. He bought you with a price, and that price was his very blood. He has earned our loyalty and his resurrection and ascension and his calling to us to be a part of his kingdom. He's not only a good king. Look what verse 11 says. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. So we behold him because he's a caring shepherd. Do you know Jesus is a caring shepherd? Again, the book of John tells you, I, he says, I'm the good shepherd who's come to lay his life down for his sheep. So that's why we behold him. He sees the needs of his people and he deals with them. If you're here today and you don't even know what you need, Jesus does. Or if you're like, I know what I need and there's a laundry list and I don't know if Jesus is patient enough to handle it. He's more than patient. Like you come with your laundry list and he's like, oh, that's it? 
I can handle that. But you don't know what I've gone through, Alex. You don't know what I've dealt with. I, you're right, I may not, but Jesus does. Probably better than you know. And he's coming. And look at his response. He gathers them and carries them close to him. Look at what it says. He will gather their lambs in his arms. You and I are his sheep. And Jesus doesn't shepherd you or care for you at a distance. He gets you really, really close. How about I smell? It doesn't scare him off. But I need to be groomed. That doesn't matter. He's the one who will make you smell good and clean you up. He brings you close. And he holds you tight and dear. It says he will carry them in his bosom. He will gently pull you tight, close to his heart. So that not only will you feel his hands that are strong and mighty, but you'll feel the tenderness of his heart towards you. So what Jesus wants you to see, he's not just a mighty king, he's a caring, loving shepherd who's willing to get in the thick and the muck and the mire of your life and not just stand there, but to get you near to him, to draw you close and to whisper to you, shh, it's okay, I'm here, I'm here. And when you hear that from your loving shepherd, you need nothing else. You need nothing else. You just need his presence to calm you down, to restore you, to give you strength. He's gentle. Do you know Jesus is gentle? Jesus, really the only place in scripture that he reveals himself and reveals his heart, he says about his own heart, he says, I'm gentle and lowly at heart. Let that bring comfort to you today. In a world that's constantly trying to beat us up and inundate us with a bunch of stuff that gives us anxiety and fear, Jesus is here to give you gentleness and lowliness and tenderness for you in your heart. He's our caring shepherd, therefore we follow his voice alone. I've been learning a lot about sheep recently just through different kind of avenues and different things I've been reading or different people I've been chatting with. And man, one of the things that we often forget about sheep is that they're actually very obedient. Like they listen well. They hear the voice of their shepherd and they go. And so if he is our shepherd and we are his sheep, we need to listen to his voice and we need to do what his voice tells us to do. So when he says, hey, go, we go. We don't question. Like the moment sheep start to question is when they get into trouble, right? They jump off cliffs or eat themselves or, you know, fall down in the pit. Like it's crazy, right? But when they hear the voice of the shepherd and they go, that's when good things begin to happen. So again, if he is our shepherd, we gladly follow his voice. Verse 12 who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. So we behold him because he is creator. Like I, I encourage you this week, like I, we're not gonna be able to do it justice in this time. Go back and read chapter 40 and see the beauty of the imagery that Isaiah is painting for us. He's like, God, God is on a beach and he dug out a hole and he puts the oceans in the palm of his hands and then drips them into the hole. There, there's the Atlantic. Oh, there's the Pacific. The whole ocean sits in the palm of his hands and he's pouring it out. That, that'll do. Look, look at what it says, right? The, he marks off the heavens with a span. He's like, all right, heavens, you can stop. Right there's enough. Like, th that's good, right, right there. He encloses the dust of the earth in a measure. So he's like, there, that, that's where I'm gonna put the earth. That's, that's big enough right there. He went out in the mountains on a scale in heaven. There's a scale. Jesus put mountains on it. That, that's heavy enough. We'll place that one there. Again, Jesus is just having a ball, having the time of his life in creating. I want you to envision God creating, not from a place of like just boredom, but a place of eager excitement and creativity. I want to put my glory on display. That's what he's doing. He's creator. And so we behold him because of his beauty in creation. He knows it all and he sets its boundaries and limits. He knows the boundaries and limits to everything. What seems limitless and boundless to you is not to him. He knows where it starts and where it stops. And he's sitting there and he's proclaiming his goodness in it. And this is Jesus. Jesus was there in the beginning. He is the creator. And everything was created by him, for him, and through him. Jesus is our creator. And because of that, he determines our value and purpose. So here's why it's important for you to know Jesus is creator. Because he determines your function, your purpose, and your value. So if he made you, you are not worthless. If he made you, you have value. You are beautiful, fearfully and wonderfully made in your mother's womb, the word tells us. And you do have purpose and value on this life or on this planet, or in this life. And he has something for you. Not for you to miraculously discover on your own, not to go on some journey where you f discover yourself. No, discover God and let him tell you who you are. It's one of the lies of this world. We'll just, you just go figure out who you are. You just be you. That's dangerous. It's deceptive and that will lead to demonic stuff happening in your life. You go to him, let him tell you who he is, who you are. Look at Moses, right? 
gets this burning bush. He doesn't tell Moses who he is first. He tells, he's, I'm God. I'm the one who's, I am. And once, once you become undone with who I am, then I'll tell you who you are. Like, that's how it starts. He is creator. We go to him to determine, again, who we are, what we're here for, and what our purpose and value is in life. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And here's, here's why that's good news. His value on you is better than your value on yourself. You probably think you're all that in a bag of chips. God thinks you're better than you actually are. And yet, we even see that there's a level of humility that we have to have before him. Where he even calls us grasshoppers here in a few seconds. You'll get, we'll get there. And yet, he values you. Again, the value is not in you, it's in him. And he's put his seal of approval on you when he said, yep, time for you to come out the womb now. That's why we look to him as creator. Verse 13. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows his, him his counsel? Whom did he consult? And who has made him understand? Who taught him the paths of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? I love these verses. We need to understand what's happening here. Isaiah is putting before these people rhetorical questions that they're absolute, they should know. Absolutely no one is the answer. Nobody's shown him that other than himself. Like, who's measured the spirit of the Lord? No one. What man shows him his counsel? Nobody. Who did he consult? Himself. <laughs> Who made him understand? He did. He made himself understand. Who taught him the path of justice? God is justice. He taught himself. He t who taught him knowledge? God is knowledge. And showed him the way of understanding? God is understanding. So here, here's what we see. We behold him because he is wisdom. Not, not he's wise. He is. He is wisdom. He is wisdom. So he understands everything and has perfect counsel within himself. God doesn't need to look anywhere but himself to figure it out. Like you and I, we need him and we need one another. That's the beauty of the church. Like when you're in a pickle, like he's here to help you and say, hey, go check with your brother and sister. They have discernment and wisdom. They have connection with me. Jesus doesn't have to do that. He's got himself and his father and Holy Spirit. And they're just hanging out. Man, we got it all figured out. This is amazing. How can we bestow our wisdom on other people? That is who he is. He is wisdom. He is knowledge and he has access to all of it. He has access to it all. And it's good that you don't. And I don't. And we trust this because there's things that we can look at how God operates or does things, especially in our own lives when it seems like uh, something catastrophic happens. God, what are you doing? God, what's up? Why? Well, one, he knows so we can take comfort. And two, if you knew, it would overwhelm you. And so you can place your trust in his loving hands because he knows. He knows it all. He is wisdom. Therefore, we do life his way and not our own. This is practical, right? It's why we do life his way. It's why we open the book and say, how do we do life, God? And he tells us, and we don't like, well, I don't know. Let me change it. Let me tweak it. Let me enhance it and make it a little better. That's what got Eve and Adam in a bunch of trouble. That's how we got sin. So again, we look at God's way of doing things, and it's not this blind ignorance. It's, hey, we trust you because you know better than us. It's like good parenting. Like God is a good, good father who wants good, good things for his kids. And so we follow him gladly. Because again, if I just let my kids do what they want, they'll run out in the street and it'll be chaos. I'm like, I love you. Get your tail back on the sidewalk. So again, God's, that's what God wants us to hear this morning. Sometimes it'll feel hurtful or unloving. It's never unloving. It may hurt because you may need it to hurt. But it's never not loving. We trust him and we do life his way. Especially in the areas that we don't agree with him on. Did you know you don't have to agree with God to obey him? That's a word for somebody. Well, I, you got to change my mind, God. He's like, I, I never said I'd change your mind. You do what I say. <laughs> he loves you. We trust him. And, and here's the reality. There's a lot of things where God's like, yeah, yeah, I'll show you. Like, he's a good, graceful God. He, he's wanting to be known. He, he says, like, I, I call you friends. Like, you're not slaves, you're friends. And so you want your friends to know your stuff. That's what, that's what he sees us like. He's a good father and a good friend, and yet... There may be areas of life you don't agree with him on, you still need to obey. And I promise you, it'll be better for you if you do. Even if you don't see the, you know, we say hindsight is twenty twenty. even if you don't see it in twenty twenty, you still trust that he knows what he's doing. Behold, the nations, verse 15, are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel nor as its beast enough for a burnt offering. That's it's a big nation saying like they, they wouldn't even do it. 
All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing in emptiness. If you're, you're new here, if you're new to this series, we've seen like Israel is this like tiny little remnant of, of people and they're constantly being afraid of these massive gargantuan nations coming in to over, um, uh, overpower and dominate them. And God's constantly reminding them like, yeah, they look big to you, but they're nothing to me. Like in one night, we read this a couple weeks ago, like God comes and wipes out some of the Assyrian army, 185,000 people wiped out and like that. So again, what seems massive and big to us is pretty small to him. Why? Because we we behold him because he's big. We behold him because he's massive. He's huge. He's big. I remember when when God saved me, this is a thing I couldn't like get away from for years. Like I would hang out with people and like, God is just so big. Like, what do you mean? I don't know. He's just massive. What what do you mean? What else? I don't know. He's just big. (laughs) And I literally was in awe because I'm just like, he is so much bigger than I am. Like all my problems that seem huge and massive and overwhelm me to the point of like paralysis by analysis. Like that doesn't happen for him because he's huge. And he, he paints this picture like all those nations that you're afraid of, they're like little trickles in a bucket. Little drops. Like they're dust on the scale. Like God, God sneezes and like 20,000 nations go flying off the scale. Again, this is trying to paint this beautiful picture for us for how massive the God we serve is. All the nations are nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing. How does that, what is that? Less than nothing. Compared to God, everything is less than nothing, right? Like that's the image here. Nations are like a drop. He is so much bigger than anything that seems like it could be an issue for you. And Jesus, when he's here on planet earth, is flexing his muscles constantly to show us how big God is. Oh, two fish and five loaves, watch what I do. Oh, Lazarus is dead. Okay, well just just hold hold your horses. Oh, there's, there's like a demon up in the cave and he's cutting himself and running around naked around town. I'll deal with it. Like storms won't stop. I'll tell them to shut their mouth. Oh, uh, water, you can't walk on it? Nah, I can. And again, he, he's not trying to do party tricks. It's not a magic show. He's trying to, though, show how big he is. Because if he can do all of that with all of those things, what can he do for your soul that's in desperate, dire need for salvation? Again, that's the point of all those miracles is to help us see our need for him. He is massive. He is big. Therefore, we treat him like he's really big. We treat him like he's big. We do not serve a small God. And like, I felt super convicted by this this week because I'm like, man, do I pray to him like he's this big? Like, sometimes I caveat my prayers. God, if your will allows it, can you squeak it in there? Or if you got some time, or we try to, again, we don't, we don't approach him with this confidence and boldness like we should if he's really this big. Pray to him like he's a big God. I just, I just want to tell you this morning, he can heal, heal. He wants to heal you. He can set you free. He can break through this morning. Like those things that you've been slamming up against for 30 plus years, he has no problem bulldozing through those walls. He can give a life. Like if you're here and you feel dead because you are spiritually dead, he can give you life. Like, like real, everlasting, sustainable, like beautiful, vibrant life. And you'll have no more time for the land of the dead. He can save. He can bring revival. This is why we don't give up on the city. Like a lot of people are writing this off. I remember when we decided to plant here, people were like, you're crazy. I'm like, why? Oh, because it's York. Excuse me. You know my God? You know what? God's been working here for a hot minute, first off. And you think he's just given up? Like it's, it's a relatively small city and there's, there's only 45,000 people. God wiped out 185,000 in one day. He saved 3,000 in one day. Like what, what can he not do with York City? Can I encourage you to dream for this city? Dream for these people? Dream for us as a family? This is again why we don't give up. This is why we're excited. This is why we are hopeful. Like our heart breaks and mourns for the sin and brokenness of the city, but that compels us to move forward in hope. Because our God is huge. He's massive. He can bring revival, he can restore, he can redeem, and he can make new. So what feels old, rusted up, broken, needs rewiring, God can in an instant heal it, make it brand new. Well, we trust him that way. Verse 18, to whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare with him? An idol? This right here, this text, like Isaiah is trying to make a mockery of our idols. I want you to see it. I want you to hear the tone, because this is the tone. An idol? You're going to compare God to an idol? A craftsman casts it in 
A goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. And he who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Like, Isaiah is making a mockery of our idols. Oh, you have God that, that literally sits above the world and puts, like, oceans in his hands and you're going to trust a piece of wood? Oh, but you laid it with gold and silver and made it all pretty. And you're too poor to give offerings, but you can get the right kind of wood to then have your emotionless God just sit there and you aimlessly pray to it. That, that's the tone right here. Like, excuse me, do you know who my God is? Like, he constantly is on the move. He doesn't say stagnant. You have this piece of wood that you're trying to throw up, like, Hail Mary's to, and it's just not working, bro. Like, would you come to the living, active, moving God? Again, this is how we should view our idols. Like, they're below him. They're beneath him. They're not worthy on the same, being on the same playing field with our God. And so we behold him because he's matchless. There's nobody like him. Our idols are a joke when we put them next to him. The only reason your idol seems enticing is because you don't have a proper view of Jesus. Because you get your eyes on Jesus, you realize how crappy your idol is. It's like, like you're offered a filet mignon and you're choosing like dog turds. Like that, that, really, that's the comparison. And for vegans, you figure it out, okay? Like, whatever that is for you. But he's matchless. Therefore, we cast our idols at his feet. We cast our idols at his feet this morning. Like, oh, we've been settling for much less than what God offers us. We'll gladly give that up to get what we cannot lose. So whatever seems like this gargantuan thing that's had a stronghold on you, I just want to encourage you today, it's no match for Jesus. And when you see that, you're much more willing to let it go. And when it rears its ugly head and entices you back, you can again let that go because that's not who you are. Because you know who you are because of who he is. Well, you lay down your idols. Verse 21, do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and his inhabitants are like grasshoppers. <laughs> like what an imagery. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely they are planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. We behold him because he is supreme. He is supreme. That means he's above. He is better than. He's altogether wonderful and above it all. Like, like again, I want you to see what God is saying here. He's ruling over all of the world. The universe is like his campground. And there's grasshoppers hopping around. That's you and me. And he spreads out a curtain, the stars, the heavens, the the. The, like all of space, all the things that we haven't even discovered yet, God's just like, there's my tent, I'm going to hang out there. It's like his sleeping bag on the campground of the universe. That, that's the picture, the image being painted here of what God is like. And it says that he brings rulers to nothing. Like all those things in our life, all the people that seem like these like things that we can never overcome, God's like, they're nothing. Like I obliterate them. He is supreme. Therefore we rest knowing that he reigns above it all. Again, you, you look at this, and it can be very daunting and overwhelming and a little bit humbling because he's calling you a grasshopper right here. In love. He's saying, you and I are like grasshoppers, and so we, we just, we rest. We just jump like little grasshoppers do and don't get overwhelmed by things that are not our business. We just rest in the loving care knowing that God is ruling and reigning above it all. And it got, grasshoppers, it's not insulting here. It's saying, like, I know you. I know all the grasshoppers, and I care about them deeply, and I love to watch them jump for my glory. So again, we rest in the fact that he reigns above it all. Verse 25, to whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One. We behold him because he's like no other. There's no one like him. He is the Holy One. You know what holy means? Set apart, different, like no other. That's what it means. And so he's like, who, who, how dare you try to compare me to somebody else? Like, tr who? Who are you going to try to put up there? Yourself? That's cute. Look, look at me. He is holy. He is like no other. Therefore, we treat him like no other. This means like Jesus has all of our affection, all of our allegiance, all of our attention, and all of ourselves. Jesus wants all of you. All of you. All of you. Not Like every part of you. Like, if you've only given him 99%, he wants the one. And he's patient, he's long-suffering, but he will have what is his. 
And I'm just here to tell you today, like, it's better in his hands than in yours. He, he is literally like no one else, so we should treat him as such. You can trust him. You can pledge your allegiance to him. And if he's like no other, then we don't project things on him that are below him. If he's like no one else, we don't project things on him that are not him. So let me just lovingly remind you, he's not like you. He doesn't have shortcomings and faults and things he needs to work on. Like he's not being sanctified. Isn't that awesome? Like, like he's the end goal. He's not like, like he, he's walking alongside us, but not because he needs work, because he's working on you. Isn't that awesome? He's not like your parents. And some of us are like, yeah, because our parents weren't the best, but some of us had great parents. Some of our parents are in the room that are great and awesome and we love them. And yet, guess what? Like God is above that. Like he, he's better. Like even where your parents in love failed you, God did not. And so we, we don't project like our daddy issues or our mommy issues onto God because he's above all of that. And if that's you in the room, I'm not saying that to belittle you or to shame you. I'm saying that to actually bring you to freedom this morning. The one that hurts you, the one who claimed to be a Christian but was a hypocrite, the one who claimed to love Jesus but then like manipulated you, the one who claimed Christ and maybe was a spiritual leader for you and actually, again, took advantage of you, God's not like that. God can be fully trusted. The one who let you down, the one who betrayed you, the one who gained your trust and then literally like stomped all over it, God's not like that. So therefore we don't project like the shortcomings of men onto our everlasting God. Verse 26, lift your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name. By the greatness of his might and because of he is strong in power, not one is missing. So we behold him because he is in control of everything. He's on high. He created it all. Like God knows all of the stars by name and where he put them. I don't even know where I leave my keys half the time. <laughs> Guys, I, true story confession. My wife got me a tile a few Christmases ago uh, because I lose my stuff. Guess what? I lost the tile before I ever got it out of the package. <laughs> Tiles are what you put on your stuff so you don't lose your stuff. I lost the thing that helps me not lose my stuff. <laughs> and yet God knows all the planets, all the stars, knows them by name, knows where he put them, never loses track of them. He doesn't need a reminder. He doesn't need an app for that. He's got it all. Nothing's out of place. So if that's true, it makes you think he's given up on you. That he's forgot about that hurt or that pain or that thing that needs work. He knows you. He hasn't left you. He is great and mighty and strong in power. And because he's in control of everything, therefore we can breathe and rest and trust and move forward in faith. Like I just wanted to clarify this this morning. Like we have no need and we have no time to dwell in hopelessness. We don't have time. The days are short. Like, the, the world is evil, and God is good. So we don't have time to waste in hopelessness. God's control and power propel us beyond anything that could paralyze us. So the last thing, we behold his power. Verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? By the way, they had heard, and they did know. And he's reminding them of what they already know. And this one's for free. Sometimes we need to be reminded of what we already know. It's actually the majority of your Christian walk will be reminding you of things you already know. And God, again, is patient and long-suffering in that. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases their strength. Verse 30, even youths shall faint and be weary. And young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. And they shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Let's dissect this for a moment. Verse 27 tells us there's nothing that is hidden from God. Nothing. So, so one of the greatest things you could hear this morning is he already knows. He knows. Like that thing that you've been hiding for years, that thing the person you trust the most doesn't know it, he knows. And if you're here and that's been causing bondage for you and exhaustion for you and your heart's walking in here heavy, he knows. And so would you just, would you let it go this morning? Would you give it to him because he already knows it? 
Would you watch the freedom and liberty and the lightness? I promise you'll like float out of the door because he knows. And he's more than capable of handling it. And when you tell him, he's not going to be like, he's <gasps> like, it's what I died for. It's what I rose for. It's what I've come to give you freedom for. He knows. Verse 28, he is the everlasting God. He's the creator of everything and he doesn't get tired. Like you, you and I get tired. Like I recently hit 30 and like I started playing tennis with Elijah and like, dude, I just leave exhausted, bro. I'm like, my ankle, my ankle popped last time we played. I don't even know what I did. I got a gray hair. I'm like, man, I need, I need a nap. Like, like <laughs> God does not get tired. He doesn't get worn out. He doesn't get exhausted. And, and, and I want you to hear like what it says here in verse 28. His understanding is unsearchable. Here's what that means. You cannot understand his understanding. And yet that shouldn't cause you to back off. It should cause you to lean in. God wants to be known. Verse 29, he gives power to those who are tired. If you're tired in here this morning, he's here to give you power. Those who have no might, who feel like you're at your wit's end, who feel like you have no strength. God, I don't even know how to cry out to you. He's here to give you strength. We just surrender. We submit. We say, God, I don't know what to do. Help me. It's more than enough. He gives power to those who are weak and tired. And then he promises that those who wait on him will renew their strength. And listen to what it says. They'll be able to soar up on wings like eagles. Be able to fly, spiritually speaking. Like your soul will be lifted beyond what you could even ask for or imagine. You begin to soar. They will run and not get tired. We were prayer walking around the city yesterday as a church and we saw some folks doing CrossFit. It's hilarious because they ran past us and they're getting after it and they're going and then on their way back, every single one of them were much slower the second time around. I'm like, yeah, y'all are getting exhausted and I just got tired of walk, or watching you walk, run. <laughs> like, I need to take a break watching y'all run. God doesn't get tired and he says, like, we can run with him and not get tired. We shall walk and not faint from exhaustion. Are you ex exhausted this morning? Are you weak? Are you in need? God is more than able. So here's our call this morning, to wait on the Lord, to wait on him. Those of us who've been around the church and we hear like the new worship songs talk about waiting on the Lord, it sounds great and catchy and cliche and cute, but what does that even mean? Because I think for us, when we think of wait, we kind of think about like waiting for the bus out there and we're just like kind of frustrated because it's running late or, you know, just kind of twiddling our thumbs. That's not what waiting means, biblically speaking. He, I love this definition. I stumbled upon it this week. Highly encourage you to write this down. This is what waiting on the Lord means. Savoring God's promises by faith until they come to fulfillment. Savoring God's promises by faith until they come to fulfillment. That is active, not passive. Like if God has promised to save the world through the preaching of the gospel, waiting on the Lord means get your tail out there and preach the gospel. Pray that hearts would be softened. If God promises, right, that he is going to make all things new, then we preach the good news that God is making all things new. If God says they will be known by the way you love one another, then we must, we must literally love the mess out of each other. Like, like not figuratively, literally. Like love each other until our mess is out. That's what it looks like to wait on the Lord. Again, this is something that requires Holy Spirit to do in us. You cannot do on your own. But we can wait on the Lord by savoring God's promises by faith. Have you ever had a meal that was so delicious that you were tempted to scarf it down, but you missed out on the beauty, the complexity, the flavor of the meal? Again, like I'm thinking, my wife asked me, what do you want for Father's Day? I'm like, I want a steak. That's what I want. And I just even think about it right now. I'm like, I don't want to destroy that thing. I want to just savor it. Sometimes, listen, some of us are so eager for God's promises to come to us or for God to do something that we actually don't savor his promises. You're so in need of God to heal or move or do something in your life that you're missing out on the beauty of what he's promised you. You miss the forest for the trees. You see what I'm saying? So, so would we be a people, and even would we start today, like actually waiting on the Lord? So I want to close by giving you some promises to savor today. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes. I'm sure I want you to hear, like, these aren't things that I've made up. This is from the word of God. These are promises. Like, literally, I found a list, and I just, I got overwhelmed. I'm like, I, I got to whittle this down, because this will take me twice as long as it took me to preach this sermon. But just let the, the promises of God wash over you this morning and savor them. 
For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our God even to the end. Psalm 48, 14. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for thousands of generations and lavishes unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. The Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 3. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. God has new mercies for you today. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at the right hand of God, pleading for us. Romans 8, 33 and 34. But if we confess our sins to him, someone needs to hear this this morning. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and clean us of all of our wickedness. 1 John 1, 9. Romans 10, 9 and 10 say, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess your faith and are saved. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Holy Spirit lives in you, Christian. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Romans 8, 10 and 11. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. Colossians 1, 13. If any one of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously. We don't have a stingy God. To all who will, uh, without finding fault, and it will be given to them. James chapter 1, verse 5. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. John 14, 27. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Romans 5, 1. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. John 15, 3. And the peace of God will transcend all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 7. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. If you've believed upon Jesus, you were a child of God. John 1, 12. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16. I tell you the truth, anyone who obeys my teaching will never die. John 8, 5. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Exodus 14, 14. This one's really good. John, or excuse me, James 4, 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Psalm 23, 5. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he was also providing a way out so that you can endure it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. God made him who knew no sin to become sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under a grace. Romans 6.14 So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Romans 6.11 and The last one. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4 All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. We have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for us, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. 
Will you behold the promises of God? Will you behold His Word? Will you behold His character? And will you behold His power?